our first speaker of this session will be Ralph Engel. And he will be speaking about ultra high energy cosmic rays. Okay. <clears throat> Hello, can you hear me? Now, it's a great pleasure to be here, and I thank the organizers for uh, getting the opportunity to talk about ultra high energy cosmic rays. And um, it turns out, in preparation of uh, this presentation, there's really no way to give justice to this subject and to cover all the new results. And this is really very much in line with what the uh, previous speakers have shown. Uh, we are right now in a period of time where there is an enormous progress in astroparticle physics, and it's also applying to ultra energy cosmic rays. Now, this conference has a very large uh, width of, or depth of uh, expertise of different people. So I want to start uh, just to recall something that is for probably 50 or 60 or even more percent of you just totally trivial. And, and one thing is, so if we talk about ultra energy cosmic rays, we typically look at the benchmark of a particle of 10 to the 20 electron volts. And if you think in terms of a proton, you would have to use LHC technology, so a Tesla superconducting magnets, everything working fine. And you would have to build LHC as big as the orbit of the planet Mercury to do it with our current technology to accelerate protons to this energy. So that gives you about the scale what we are talking about. And even in, in the terms of astrophysics, it's really huge. And of course, people thought about it. And uh, if you're a particle physicist, you right away come up with some fancy ideas of super heavy particles being produced in the early universe, decaying later at a rate that is suitable, adjusted, that you see them from time to time. And then you have uh, fragmentation functions. You can have SUSY and all sorts of things. And it uh, looks really good. Uh, or if you are an astrophysicist, you think in terms of acceleration with uh, shock fronts, and then you have this famous Hillas plot with the magnetic field here, the size of the object here, everything that is on this side can do it, everything that is on this side is too weak either in the size or in the magnetic field and can't do it. And some of the things, I mean, the objects drawn here, of course, are the ones we are interested in, and then you see we have AGN jets, uh, we have gamma ray bursts, we have the hotspots of AGN jets. And of course, we also have uh, neutron stars to some extent. So, but in general, we have a hard time to find objects that are comfortably well-placed to accelerate particles to this energy. So this is one of the problems we have to deal with. The second problem is actually how to get these particles to Earth. And it turns out that the microwave background and the infrared and the uh, or the other backgrounds uh, at similar energy are actually a real obstacle in this sense. So if a proton comes, it will produce E plus E minus pairs traveling. That is going to change if you have a power law, E cubed times a flux, a flat change, uh, imprints a dip. And then there's a sort of a cutoff appearing because you have then, in the end, you produce delta resonances. This is the famous GZK, the kreisen zatzepkin kuzmin effect. And you have something very similar for ions where you have the disintegration. You simply excite a giant dipole resonance and you split the nucleus into smaller ones. And I show you this plot actually more to emphasize the following. So in both cases, you get some very strong suppression in the spectrum. And if you look, for example, for iron proton, it happens even at the same energy, which is a degeneracy. It's just a coincidence by nature. So we have a very hard time to distinguish like between silicon and iron or proton in terms of this type of suppression because they are just by chance at the same energy. But what is very interesting, if you go to very high energy particles, you have a very important effect. At lower energy, you see very far into the universe. And this is shown here. So you see particles coming from redshift 4 or 1 or even point 0.1. But if you go into this edge where the suppression is, it drops. You see only local sources because of this suppression effect. You see sources that are in your neighborhood. And that applies for protons as well as for iron, uh, or for ions in general. You see really local sources. And if you look like this is 3 megaparsec, 9 and then 27, and you can compare the colors with these inner rings, how the spectrum builds up. So you actually really see nearby sources. And, and that's a big difference to, for example, neutrino astronomy. If you go to high enough energies, you are sure it's a source in your neighborhood. There's no way to avoid it. It's the only problem now is how to identify the source. And this brings me to the next slide. Of course, 
there is another thing and that helps you with uh, dealing with it, and that is you have the problem of the magnetic field deflection, but the higher the energy of the particle is, the less it is deflected. And that's, of course, something uh, very nice. And if you look at this map, for example, let's assume the red dots are sources, and the small dots you see here are the cosmic rays arriving. And if everything works out and you have the deflection just by the galactic magnetic field being not too st uh, strong, then you see those tails, energy ordered, the cosmic rays arriving, or here this cloud relative to the source. You wouldn't see anything in the direction of the galactic center because the magnetic fields are too strong there. But you would have places on the map where it works very well. But of course, things are very, very complex. And this is what you see in this plot. If you have a source somewhere here, and you have a source environment, you have to get the particles out, the particles propagate, there are large voids, there are then filaments, there are sheets, there are clusters, you have to cross until you get the particle to the place where you can observe it. And that's, of course, making business very complex, even if you have a good chance to see this correlation. Now, the next problem is, of course, how do you detect those particles? Because they are extremely rare. And you do it with air showers, and this is shown here, an air shower coming in, and large air shower arrays. So you have many particle detectors here, and you typically combine them at the highest energy that turned out to work very well. You combine them with fluorescence telescopes that see the fluorescence light those particles produce in the atmosphere. So you can measure with this fluorescence light the profile of the shower, and you can measure the particle imprint. And the fluorescence light is very nicely the, giving you the calorimetric energy. It's like a calorimeter in high energy physics. And if you look at the footprint, this is what you can always measure, because the, the detectors are working day and night, while the fluorescence light is so dim that you can only do it at dark nights. So if you look at the footprint, you can still conclude what the shower is. If you have a few of those, where you can really calibrate very nicely on this longitudinal profile. So you use your footprint, use a typical characteristic quantity, convert it, you can determine your energy, then simply from this type of measurement here, for example, the density of particles at 1,000 meters from the shower core. And there is lots of information in the time structure, how the particles arrive, and things like that I can't really talk about here today. Now, um, we will use this. We will use the depth where this maximum is reached in the atmosphere to, to determine the primary mass, but we will also use the time structure of the signal to estimate what the primary mass is, so whether we had protons here, carbon, or even photons coming in. Now, one thing is, of course, uh, important is uh, what are the key players in this field? And that is currently the Pierre Auger Observatory in Argentina and the telescope array here in the US. And uh, I've just indicated where they are here. And you have to think of it, these are really the latest cutting edge detectors in the field. But they are very different, actually. And I will show you. First of all, they're very different in size. One is 3,000 square kilometers in size, and one is about 700 square kilometers. But now you would say, OK, this is so big, so why should I care about the small one? Actually, a telescope array is of crucial importance to cover the northern sky. And you see this here. If you look at the declination band, what the exposure of the detectors is. So this is what the Auger exposure is, and this is what the telescope array exposure is. And it fills this very crucial gap, and you will see it really adds a lot of data. Now, there is a large asymmetry, of course, in the exposure, simply due to the size of the detectors. It's almost a factor of 10. So I will use very often the OG data, but there are, of course, times where we get the information only from the TA data. And together, it's really actually a very unique combination to cover the sky and do physics with. Now, I'm not going to really show you how this looks like in, in terms of uh, the detectors themselves, because they are highly complex objects. One uses water Cherenkov tanks to measure the, uh, the the data, and you will have talks in the parallel sessions here. And the other one is uh, using scintillators to measure the data at ground. And they are calibrated in different ways, and they analyze largely in different ways. So there are really independent data sets, and there is a type of competition. And that's actually very good, because this is how you can really make sure that the data are reliable. So how does it look like? Here, I show you the spectrum from the OG Observatory. And you see very nicely the ankle, then a very strong suppression, as we expect from the propagation effects. And uh, if you compared the telescope array spectrum 
So the blue is here the OG one. This is a telescope array one. They are actually very nicely in, uh, aligning. And if you account for the uncertainty, uh, which is like 14% in the energy for OG or 21% for telescope array, you only have to shift them by 10%. And they align very well, except at the highest energy part. And that is something that we have had already now for a couple of years. Now, if you look at it, I just want to draw your attention. I drew uh, now here the full spectrum. Look how strong the suppression is. You go from the knee to the anchor, and you almost go the same way down in the suppression region. There we are now. We have collected so much data that we go essentially two orders of magnitude down in the suppression. So we look at the very rare local sources with those events now that are really nearby. Now, there's a question, of course, are these spectra compatible? And there are working groups in the experiments comparing things. And this is shown here. So this is the all sky for the north and the south. And you see the spectra are very al well aligning here, but they are different here. And if you look only at the common declination band, it's basically, oh, this is not, look, uh, it's, if you look only in the common declination band where you have overlap, there the spectra should be the same, of course. And, uh, and indeed, they look much more compatible with each other in the common declination band. And then you can look at the Singer experiment like in OG, you don't see any declination dependence. But if you look at TA, you actually have indications that there is a declination dependence. And that you will see later is also seen in the anisotropy. So there is some real physics. But if we, if we get sensitive to individual sources because we really go into suppression range, this is what you would expect. You expect anisotropy. So you expect the spectrum not being universal in the suppression range. Now there's something very nice that will be also shown in the uh, parallel session the telescope array did, they actually extended very much to low energy their reach with TIL, with the low energy extension telescopes, and you, then you see the suppression region, the anchor, and you see very nicely for the first time so clearly the second knee here, and this is a feature that a number of experiments have seen. For making the spectrum, of course, you really have to work very hard because at low energy, the calorimetric energy you see, what the shower deposits in the atmosphere, and what the total energy is, is really different. And that is shown here as a ratio. So at high energy, if you are at the highest energies, it's only a correction of a few percent. At low energy, you have to correct by 20, 30%. This has been done, and it really looks beautiful here. Now, let me switch to the composition. And uh, in terms of the composition here, the, you look at the depths of shower maximum, and you have the situation that you have uh, iron showers not fluctuating very much because the initial cross-section of the nucleus is very large, but proton showers partially developing very deep and partially very shallow. And if you plot the mean depths of shower maximum, this is what it looks like, for example, in the OJ data. Here you have the comparisons with model simulations. This is the iron lines. These are the proton lines. And it really looks like we go towards protons, and then we go towards heavy. And if you look at the shower-to-shower -shower fluctuations, this is what it looks like. It's compatible with just being protons, and it's going down. And you see, we had some time ago fluctuations here. Now it's really going down very fast. And there's uh, something really non-trivial in this plot, and I want to point this out here. If you had a superposition of just proton and iron and started with 100% protons, then you are in the range where proton fluctu uh, fluctuations are. If you put a little bit iron in, because they are shifted in depth, your fluctuations actually increase. And only once you have almost taken all protons out, you reach the iron line. So you literally ha cannot have any small amount of protons in, otherwise your fluctuations will be very large because protons are much deeper. And, and that's an important thing. Now, uh, <clears throat> and we see the fluctuations being very small at high energy showers. Now, if you take your x-max distributions and each shower is one entry here with the depth of maximum, you can look at this distribution fitted for a superposition of proton, helium, carbon, silicon, and iron, or, or depending on how many mass groups you want to use. This is done here with four groups. And then you can look at the energy versus the composition. And you see protons here and dying out around 18.5. Then helium coming in. Then later, nitrogen coming in but no need for iron. So this is actually a puzzle, and this is something that we really had not expected. First of all, we have a large amount of protons at a place where we didn't expect it. And then we don't have protons where we actually had hoped to see them. But I also have to tell you, we don't really know what 
the suppression region, where really the action goes on, is not covered because we only can measure those things at night, so we have only 10% duty cycle, so we really don't know what the composition in the suppression region is. And because we really lower the number of sources in the suppression region, there is a lot of surprises to expect it too. Now, if you compare this to telescope array, and that's an interesting story. Telescope array is, of course, a much smaller instrument, so for them it's actually uh, difficult to um, do a lot of quality cuts on the events uh, because you would lose a lot of events. Oji can be very comfortably say, okay, I discard 30% of the events and take only the very best for the composition. Uh, there are different ways of doing it. In the case of, of OG, you would say, okay, let's, if a shower comes along this direction in, you have a field of view of the telescope, it can have its maximum somewhere here or here or here. If it's here, I wouldn't see it. So I'm not accepting all the showers here. I say all showers coming along this direction, I'm not accepting because I don't have enough uh, reach in my observation. I only take showers from here where I can actually see showers with a maximum at 1,000 grams or 600 or 700. And I also discard showers like this. This is what Oji is doing. Oji geometrically selects showers where you have the largest acceptance to make sure that you have unbiased distribution. In the case of telescope array, you use all showers you get where the maximum is in the depths or in the field of view. That means you take showers with this geometry and if they happen to have a deep maximum, you accept them. If they have a shallow one, you just don't see them. You get this way a biased distribution and you have to do this in Monte Carlo then as well. And so you get, uh, like, the, pro uh, the proton prediction here looks almost like data, but this is a proton prediction. And here, for example, you have the prediction for nitrogen, and you have the for iron. And this is different ways, the black are different ways to analyze the data. And uh, it's very interesting, actually, if you look at this, uh, you see the telescope array data is also not on top of the protons. It's actually, and this is mod the model is QGH204 here, if we go back, QGH204 is the blue points here. It's helium, basically, in this range. And it's protons here in our fit, in OG. And if you look at the data here, it's essentially the same. This is helium here, the pink underneath. So there is a, is a very good agreement, actually, between the data. And, uh, and if there is a, it's actually mainly a misunderstanding that the uh, data are not compatible with each other. So the two experiments see basically the same. Of course, telescope array has a much larger uncertainty, so they could still say that they are compatible with pure protons because it touches the uncertainty band. Oji has a smaller uncertainty and it's not touching it anymore. And of course, it's a matter of what models you compare to. And if you use LHC data, we know these are the pre-LHC model predictions. You see, the, for example, the Oji points here as a reference and you could pick a model easily where you could say it's all protons. If you go to the post-LHC data where you have tuned everything, no way to pick a model where you just have protons. So if, uh, and QGH204, what I showed you before, is a post-LHC model. And so it's not surprising that the proton line is here and the data is here also for telescope array. So that, that has caused a lot of misunderstandings in the past, but actually there's no real difference between the experiments. Now, uh, if you try to combine your flux measurement and composition and fit it with models. You put a, a power law in, rigidity-dependent cutoff because you assume it's uh, first-order Fermi acceleration. That's, of course, a strong assumption. And then you do a fit, and, and, uh, and you can reproduce your x-max fluctuations mean and the, uh, and the overall flux. And what you get is something very interesting. You have to put your cutoff very low. Protons disappear very early, and it turns out your cutoff for nitrogen and silicon is just in the suppression range, if you scale it. I calculated it for you here for, for nitrogen. It's three times 10 to the 19. It's very low. And then silicon extends a little bit further, which means this suppression actually largely comes from the cutoff in the source, and it's not coming from propagation. That's something we had not expected. That's totally new. But this is what the data look like. And there's another surprise. The injection spectrum, e to the minus, two we were expecting from first order Fermi acceleration, or 2.3. It's e to the minus 0.6 or 0.8 or 0.1, 0.6, depending on how you account for the, geomagnet uh, for the uh, magnetic fields. This is a calculation that accounts for the local structure of possible source distributions, magnetic fields, delaying low energy particles more than high energy particles. So this is really the visits and belts, the high end 
uh, simulation, this is a simplified one which has even stronger the effect. So that's the second surprise. We have a very hard injection index. The third one, which is maybe even more a surprise and not understandable, actually shows us we have 70% nitrogen or silicon or 80% and have literally no proteins injected at the source. So somebody has to come up with an idea how to do this. How can you possibly have just heavy elements in your source and not something else injected? That's another surprise we have had. Well, you can avoid a lot of those problems if you assume sources that have a negative source evolution with a redshift. That means if you think in terms of star formation rate, you have a redshift, this M would be 3.5 plus 3.5. So you have more active sources in the past. If you had less active sources in the past, M to the power minus 3, Z or 1 plus Z to the power minus 3 or 1 plus Z to the power minus 6, then it's actually uh, helping you. And Andrew Taylor pointed out just uh, three weeks ago that there are indeed sources in the Fermi catalog that have a negative redshift evolution, like this low luminosity, high Susan-Gruton peak, be a lux. So that's maybe going to help. As a side effect, of course, you expect much fewer neutrinos coming from there because they come from large distance. So let me come to the last part, and that is anisotropy. So um, we are actually very proud that we have now an anisotropy detected at five sigma level. That's also something really new in cosmic ray business. And, uh, and it's at fairly low energy, so we don't see anything in the energy window that is just in the, around the ankle. But above the ankle, we do see a dipole anisotropy, and here you see the analysis in the right ascension, a Rayleigh analysis in a very clean dipole. And if you calculate it, uh, including the trial factors, you are above five sigma now. And this is how the sky map looks like here. This is in galactic coordinates. This is where the dipole is. It's uh, at the level of 6%, 6.5. And if you think, what is this direction? Is there anything unique about it? If you do a simulation with a local matter distribution, like use a two MRS catalog, then you would have uh, expect most particles coming from here if they are extra galactic. And they are deflected by the magnetic field in this direction. And because we have lots of protons in this range, the deflection isn't very large. So we actually do see this dipole. It's also something nobody really had foreseen, that we see a large-scale dipole that tells us those particles are extragalactic. There's also some other interesting effect here. The dipole is very small, and we have lots of protons in this range just below the anchor. And if you have lots of protons below the anchor, the question is, are those protons galactic or extragalactic? And it turns out those protons cannot be galactic because if they were galactic and were produced in the galactic plane, you would have like a 10% anisotropy, but you don't see it. We are well below. So that means these are all extragalactic. That means actually the transition between galactic and extragalactic cosmic rays has to take place somewhere below 10 to the 18 electron volts. That's also a new result. Okay, so let me come to the, to the hotspot that you are probably interested in. The telescope array has observed this hotspot in the northern part. Oji has some kind of a warm spot in the southern part, so it's 20 degrees excesses. And if you look at uh, an update here, this is what it looks like now with uh, new data. The, we are now nine years in the data. The hotspot has slightly shifted from a 20 degree size to 25 degree size, but the significance hasn't really so much grown. So we really need more data to say more about it. Okay, there's some other interesting thing that I want to report, and that is the search for anisotropy by looking at correlations with a, a tracer, like uh, you, you use a catalog, like AGNs I showed you at the beginning are very nice candidates to be accelerators, so we use an AGN catalog, this Fermi catalog here, and pick 17 nearby objects that are in the GZK sphere, and then we use the starburst galaxies. We use this, uh, the same search list as Fermi has used to look for the correlation between the radio and gamma rays. And that would be 23 objects. And if you do it with proper trial factors, we actually see nothing really significant with the AGNs. But there is something always already for a long time that is a level of a probability of 10 to the minus 3, trial corrected. And, uh, but the, with the starburst, we see actually something that is uh, at the level 10 to the minus 6, or if you correct it, then 10 to the minus 5. And, uh, and we are working on this and trying to understand what's uh, going on. There seems to be a, a correlation, so there is an indication for anisotropy. 
I don't really have the time to go into this very much in detail, so I want to come here to the point just to make the comments, uh, to wrap it a little bit up, and that uh, we have really a much more complicated picture now, and there are models, a lot of different classes of models account for the local environment, for the escape of cosmic rays from sources, and you can really have a, you get a, a different dimension in modeling the spectrum, and you can really get extra galactic protons appearing below the anchor, far below the anchor, actually. And uh, it's all much more complicated now. We have been very successful having OG and TA working together in joint working groups and exchanging data and, and understanding, but still working independent, having really reliable independent data. And of course, what I didn't say, what I didn't show is multi-messenger. The key, of course, is here dealing with neutrinos and with photons. And uh, you see this is a signal that IceCube has seen. These are the limits from Auger, for example. Depending on what you have as an evolution, if you assume protons as primaries, it's basically already limited or excluded. If you have heavy elements as, as a preferred option, you are still compatible with those limits. And there's a very strong limit coming in from Fermi from the diffusive background, which is probably the strongest in the near future. So what's next? That is telescope array times four. We want to go bigger, and that's very nice, and it's uh, funded, and I'm very happy about it, because it really gives us a detector of similar size in the northern part. So we can do anisotropy at the highest energies with two similar size detectors. It's really changing very much, and the hope is to understand this better. And OG is putting scintillators on top of the water Cherenkov tanks to understand really, and I want to show you only a picture how this looks like. It's a fairly straightforward operation, and with this, you can measure the composition in the suppression range for the local sources. And you can say, okay, this produces a few light elements, and this one heavies, and we have uh, like 12 stations working. This is such a lateral distribution, or this is a ratio of electromagnetic to the total signal. It's working beautifully, and it's soon going to be online for the entire array. Thank you. All right, we have time for a question or two. Yeah, so um, can you go back to slide 22? Um, it was where you had the, 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 source, the, the, the source constraints from it. Um, so what I was wondering here was, um, because as you, said, as you said before, uh, as you get closer and closer to the cutoff, you're sampling a, a, a much smaller volume of the universe. So how would something like this change if, um, if you were fitting against the, the TA data, for instance, which has a much different change at that, or a much different spectrum at that higher energy? So in, in the case of TA, you're not so much forced to have negative source evolution. With TA, actually, you could have a source evolution that is easily m equals zero or even three. But, but, the, but the low energy part, if you, you, if you try to fit all the, I mean, the suppression itself allows, has no sensitivity to this evolution. It's really the part where you want to include the anchor. And if you use the TA data, the limits are not so strong. If you use the OG data, it's, it's much stronger. But, but actually, we don't favor strong evolution right now. So that means we, we actually favor low neutrino rates, low gamma rates from, from distant sources. But TA has a much uh, weaker limit on this than OG. That's correct. And it's not coming really from the suppression range itself because it's very, very local, yeah. All right, we have time for one more. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, is there a measurement of the uh, cosmic spectrum inside a hotspot and outside a hotspot or yes. some kind of variation? Uh, yes, uh, actually, I didn't show it. Uh, the, 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 there's an interesting point in the hotspot. So the hotspot uh, adds, well, it's, no, it probably takes too much time. Uh, it, the hotspot has events that is just in the suppression region enhanced, so it's above 60 or 6 times 10 to 19 electron volts. You have more events, but you also have a lack of events at lower energy. So th there, is a, there is an interesting part. So if you, uh, there, there are missing energies at lower energy, so you have a, a region of depletion. And that you could argument actually uh, could be related to magnetic field effects, that actually it's almost like lensing, that you get some particles being diverted and others coming in, and so you get uh, a, a change from an under-density to over-density. 
But that's a lot of speculation. Yeah? But, uh, but the hotspot looks a bit weird, I would say, physics-wise. But, uh, but we have had a lot of surprises we had not expected. Yeah? So, All right. Let's thank Ralph again.